I'm Ernst Sundel with another Voice of Freedom program. Tonight we have as a guest Michael Hoffman II, an author of four books, numerous newsletters. He's also a researcher. Mike Hoffman, you have written a controversial book about they were white and they were slaves. Yes. How did you come to write this book? Well, originally I came across a book on white servitude in Virginia by a man named J.C. Bala. And uh, I became very intrigued by his idea that white servitude was not limited to this uh, juvenile kind of sophomoric notion that's pushed in high school that uh, persons of white background who were put into in so-called indentured servitude had a very privileged type of bondage and that, uh, that that bondage was very temporary and then it was ended after a period of four or seven years and they re-entered the ruling class and went about the job of exploiting black people. Uh, J.C. Bala, it's a very thin book of about a hundred pages I believe, raised the point that there were some aspects of white servitude that were consonant with, what, with slavery. And so that raised a red flag in my mind. Uh, Bala is deceased. It was an older book from, I believe, the 1930s, circa 1930s. And it stimulated something inside of me to say, if one man could say this, maybe others have said it. Now, of course, this kind of white indentured labor is nothing new to Europeans, because in the former Soviet Union or under Tsars in Russia, people basically were serfs, and serfs were tantamount to white slaves. Where, is there a difference? Uh, there is a difference, I think, in the sense that in Russia, serfdom was very much a formal codified institution. In fact, there were two forms of serfdom. One was the bondage to the land, and the other was part of a formal Russian bureaucracy, which existed uh, inside the government and ha had a uh, tremendous record-keeping process. So there was a difference in terms of the serfdom itself within Russia. But, of course, in the larger sense of were these people uh, slaves, and by slaves I define it as lifetime bondage, bondage unto death, yes, they were. And I think it's astute of you to say that this is nothing new because, of course, enslavement of all people and all races has always been a phenomenon in history. Uh, we can go back to ancient Greece and ancient Rome where there was always a slave class comprised of white people as well as of other races. We find this in the sections of the Islandic, Icelandic and Viking sagas in terms of the phrase thrall. You know, nowadays we say you're in thrall to someone. They have a mental power over you. In that era, it meant a physical power over you. And, of course, the Bible, contrary to what humanistic misinterpreters of Christianity have alleged, the Bible fully sanctions enslavement. We have had a mistranslation of the King James Bible, which says, uh, servants, be faithful unto your masters, in Ephesians. But in the original Greek, it says, or connotes, the word would be the Latin service, which means slave, slaves, be faithful. Uh, faithful unto your masters. So there is no uh, New Testament or Old Testament prohibition against slavery. In the Old Testament, the prohibition is one of qualification, which is to say, if you are an Israelite, if you are a believer in the one true God of the Hebrews, then you can only be a bondsman to a fellow Hebrew for seven years. Anything beyond seven years in the eyes of the ancient Israelites was kidnapping. And that law was brought over to New England in the 17th century because the Puritans tried to keep the Old Testament law in that regard. But in the New Testament, uh, in terms of enslaving people of a non-Christian Israelite background, I don't see that there was any limitation to that. Bringing you up through the Middle Ages, through the thraldom of the Ice Icelandic era and so forth, we also have the Vikings conducting really a uh, international trade in the, um, ensla the capture and enslavement of white people, Irish, uh, Norwegians, the Danes would capture the Norwegians in battle and sell them. And actually there became a capital along the coast of Spain where the Vikings would meet with Arab slavers and sell whites that they had captured and raided to Arabia. And uh, so you have that. And then also in the Middle Ages, 
you have a phrase that's very interesting in terms of modern usage called villainage or villains, V-I-L-L-E-I-N-S, which would have been a French Carolonian term and then became anglicized as our modern day bad guy, villain, V-I-L-L-A-I-N. And what I found in the course of my research is there was a persistent demonization of poor white people. In other words, in many eras in, in white society, if you were poor, it was tantamount to being a criminal. And that criminalization was then uh, a connotation for making you a slave. And this slavery, by the way, this villainage, even was hereditary. In the chronicles that I read and in the accounts that I read, there was a almost biological taint on children of parents who had been white slaves or villains. So to summarize, I would say that s the enslavement of whites, far from being a very brief period in the annals of time, was in fact the universal experience of whites. So now we come to the modern period, and we have this absurd stereotype which denotes black skin with servitude. And it's absurd. It's a folly. So I'm bringing the good news to black people that they are not of any more of a slave race than whites have been. And I'm also bringing good news to white people to say, you don't owe anybody anything. At least not the majority of white people don't. Perhaps the British aristocracy does. Perhaps those who were the heirs of codifying and institutionalizing white slavery in the United States are. However, they were a lot more politic uh, about how they codified it, because in many of the New England rules and regulations for servitude, it would say that this had to be biblical. It had to be limited to seven years. And that's where we hear in our high school history classes, when they give their minute and a half to the subject, they'll say, well, you can't compare white bondage to black slavery because the whites didn't do very difficult work and the enslavement was all over with within seven years. No way. There were many loopholes and abuses of that law. As you and I know, there can be a law on a piece of paper. That doesn't mean that that's what's lived or brought into action. And for example, if you were a white slave and you did work that was unsuitable, or if you tried to run away, how were they penalized? In some cases, by whippings, very onerous whippings. I have found accounts of almost fatal doses of whippings. There has been uh, the recent firestorm of hysteria about this Jewish teenager who was to be caned in Singapore. I believe it was seven cane strokes and he was ultimately administered four. Well, white slaves had to endure hundreds of lashes and many of them died of that. But another way of penalizing them was to add time onto their length of service. If you were ran away a day, that was a month of additional service. If you ran away for a month, that was a year of additional service. If you stole from your master, that could be months of additional service. If you had a corrupt master, and the courts listened, the courts of Assis listened more to the master than they did to you, he could have all kinds of trumped up charges against you, as happened in the Caribbean, and as happened in the United States and the tobacco plantations, and it meant that in reality it boiled down to a lifetime of enslavement under the euphemism of indentures. No. Were these people allowed to marry and have children? No. Uh, a white uh, woman who had a child out of wedlock uh, because she was not allowed to marry, so any child she did have would be out of wedlock. If it was a male child, that child became a slave until the age of majority, and the age of majority was 21 for males, and a female issue from that woman uh, would be a slave unto that woman's master until the child, the white child was 18.